Cristina Paula Rodriguez. I'm from El Callao, Peru. We immigrated to the U.S., to Miami, in the late 90s, and my mom became a born-again Christian, evangelical Christian. My whole entire childhood, really, from that point, was just like everything was church, and then like the pockets of in-between were like, oh yeah, you have to go to school. It never clicked for me. I never accepted Jesus the way you're supposed to. I never like felt the spirit the way you're supposed to. And then as I got older, I got really into dance and theater. Specifically in middle school, it was like heavy dance and then theater in high school because I went to performing arts centered high school. In high school, everything shifts because the school is just much more important. You're planning for your future and then sort of combining that with having to go to church three or four times a week became much more of a big deal. So it was like having to convince my mother that like school was important. And for me, I was like, I just want to do theater every day. Like, how can I make this happen? And then my time in church was also difficult because the kids who were my age who went to church, who I actually went to school with, definitely like were fully in <laughs> to that evangelical experience. We're fully into like we are like the children of God. In that like pocket of time, I met my best friend at the time and she was like this amazing person that I wanted to spend all my time with. And we made sure we spent like every day together as much as we could. And, and so then that became another battle against church because it was like, why do I have to go to church when I could just be at my bestie's house? Slowly, I like started to realize that like I wanted to spend all my time with her. I was like, wow, what are you doing today? Oh, like, oh, you have a boyfriend. That's cool, but like we should hang out. <laughs> and she similarly would be like, oh, Dina, why don't you come with me and her boyfriend at the time? Like, why don't, like she was always inviting me as like, it felt like a third, but not a third, because we were like 15. <laughs> and then we were like hanging out at school at like her house once and it just like, I don't know how, but like she kissed me and I was like, huh, <laughs> what is this feeling? <laughs> what is happening? And up to that point, I had no moment of thinking of my sexuality. And I, of course, then like walked home and was like spiraling. <laughs> like I was like, what is this feeling? Oh my God, like what's going on? And then I remember the next day in school, it was as if nothing had happened. And then how we usually went home, I mean, we went to her house. It was like, it like flipped. As soon as we walked into her house, it was very like, like we were in love. It was this very like beautiful moment because it had no shame. There was just like, oh, I'm gay. Okay, that's awesome. Maybe that's why like, I felt like different in my family or different in my church experience or different with like the kids that I had grown up with. I was like, oh, this is like such a relief. Um, and then I went home and I had like insinuated to my mom that I might have feelings for my friend, but I hadn't said, oh, I'm gay or I'm a lesbian. I had just like sort of insinuated that it may be something that I felt. Uncoincidentally, like the next week when I was about to go on a theater competition, she was like, you can go to this, but you have to go to church camp if you want to go. So I went to church camp and when I got there, it sort of like slowly dawned on me that every kid that was there was like struggling with something, very different thing, right? Like whether it was like divorce or like some sort of substance or just like general teenage angst. We would go to these like really long church sessions for like what felt like eight hours, but maybe it was four. And like the whole time they would preach and preach. And at the end of each service, they would ask the kids to accept Jesus into their hearts. So when you're evangelical, you go to the front of the church, people lay hands and usually you feel the spirit. And by that, it means that you like fall to the ground and you're reborn. And so it came to the end of that week. What was, I think it was like a, a, a long weekend church camp thing. And I was on the very short list of kids who had yet to feel the spirit. So they brought us up. I'm slowly, I'm just seeing everybody fall, feeling the spirit. And they get to me and I'm like, in my head, I'm like, okay, I don't know, I don't know about this. And so the preacher is preaching and he's talking about how like, this is all in Spanish, which is, makes it very specific. And he's talking about saving me and like bringing me into this world of God and like love and whatever. So I was just standing there, very rigid, kind of like the, the most like stoic I had ever been, it felt in my life. And I could like see him being frustrated. Like I could see him like thinking that I was like, purposely battling against him, which was just not the case. 
And so he brought over his wife, who was also a preacher, and then they were both laying hands on me. He was in front of me, kind of like pushing against me, like telling me to accept God. And she had her hands on the back of my shoulders, trying to essentially push me down, trying to get me to accept God. And I just like was very much like kind of the strongest I had ever been in that point and just kind of looked them in the face and didn't say anything. It was just very much like, well, this isn't going to happen because I don't feel this. And there's nothing here, right? He was like, you're just not ready today, but that's okay. You know, like there's always tomorrow and God is always here for you. On the bus ride home, um, cause it was a few hours away from Miami. I was like in my head about that moment, like quite a bit. And I felt like actually like deep shame that someone would have to tell my mom that I was the only kid who didn't accept God. And I saw her and they told her and I could see the disappointment in her face. And I like went to bed that night and then I went to school the next day and I saw my friend and I was like, oh, I'm definitely gay. Specifically that moment for me was like this huge relief of like, you know, if I can be gay while having so many people pushing against it, then I'm obviously this and there's no shame in this because this must be the path that I'm supposed to take. So I was still that summer going to church just as much as I had to. I just felt even far more removed than I had already originally felt. I sort of, I felt forced to be there. And so that's kind of how I acted. And then the next year in 11th grade was the end that my mom told me that I could like get a, a weekend job. And so when I got a weekend job, uh, part of the catalyst to that was because I wouldn't have to go to church if I had a weekend job because church happened on the weekends at that point. Um, and then at that point, I fully stopped going to church. A lot of I can only speak to Latina immigrants do become evangelicals because there's like a need for community when you come to a new country. And I think that's what my mom was looking for, especially for her children. But I just never found community there. I found it in theater. And like, obviously, it was because theater was full of queer kids and I love theater. I just didn't know that that's what I was looking for. And then when I found it, I was like, oh, well, this is my place. Finding my queerness gave me this like understanding of oh, you just, this can't be true because my queerness is so important and so joyful and so happy, so how could it possibly be a sin? So it gave me the, like, the moment of liberation of being like, you were exactly right. Of course you couldn't buy into this because you're, nothing about your queerness is wrong. Mm -hmm.